Hi, everyone, and welcome to a very special Talking Song episode. Doran, welcome. Coach Daniel, thank you so much for having me. A pleasure to be here. Anytime. And uh, so first of all, for, for people uh, in the community who don't know Doran, you connected with me. I, I, don't, I don't remember if it was an email or a message, but you were like, hey, do you want to chat? I'm also a sleep coach. We did chat, and we had a lot in common, uh, and, and you uh, told me that you had gone through your own insomnia journey, so I thought we, you could share that's always helpful for people. So again, thanks for being here. My pleasure. I really appreciate and value your work. Uh, I love the insight that you're bringing to our community. I love how much you're genuinely want to help people and, uh, and, and doing for people across the spectrum of insomnia. So it's, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to work with you, to, uh, to learn from you, and, and to be here on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much. So nice, it's nice again you're here. Uh, so yeah, um, without further ado, actually, do tell us uh, like your own story. How did it start? Sure. Yeah. You know, my, um, I was originally once, once upon a time pre-med, I, uh, my father was a doctor and I went to UCLA and studied psychobiology. Uh, my real interest in sleep didn't arrive until I myself struggled with insomnia. Um, as many kind of similar stories, I had a very stressful period in life and, you know, there was just a lot going on. I was under a lot of tension and that night I couldn't sleep. I was never a great sleeper, but I never had major issues, but that night I really couldn't sleep. Um, and then I'm sure as you see, were probably most of your clients that really sparked the sleep anxiety. Then the question became in my mind, Oh my gosh, what happens if you can't sleep tonight? What happens if you can't sleep tomorrow night? You know, quickly do something about this. Go, go get sleeping pills, you know, cure this issue, go to a therapist, go to a doctor, you know, like I, I, how this, you have this disease, you know, how did you ever sleep to begin with? What happens if this goes on forever? You know, all of these thoughts, just, you know, like a tidal wave, you know, like rushing towards you. Um, and that was, you know, something that was very, as anyone has struggled with insomnia, it's a lot of very powerful emotions come with that fear, loneliness, anxiety, you know, catastrophization a lot. It's not a fun place to be. Um, and I think, you know, this was, I guess, uh, a few years back before maybe as many sleep coaches were, you know, were abundant and even, you know, before the days that, you know, the internet was so prolific with so many people that are there to help. So I ended up, um, I ended up on Ambien for a few weeks and I ended up going to psychologists who unfortunately were not really trained in how to help sleep issues and as well meaning as they were um they were ultimately not not very helpful with my sleep and so you know and that's a big problem because when people go to train professionals and you think well if my doctor can't cure this and you know a psychologist with you know 25 letters after his name can't cure this i mean i must have the worst case of insomnia in the world this is some you know in incontractable disease you know contractable disease that has absolutely no cure and you go on google and insomnia has no cure and you're like oh my gosh you know this is terrible like why is my case of insomnia so severe that no one in the world can treat it um and that really fuels the anxiety even more um so my kind of initial road out of it ended up reading, and I think you were uh, a big fan of as well, um, uh, Sasha Stevens' um, The Effortless Sleep Method. Um, and that was something that was very, I mean, first of all, just kind of resonating, because when you struggle with, with insomnia, you feel like the only person in the world. Like, why does everyone in the world just seem to sleep without any issues except me? I remember even walking around my neighborhood at like three o'clock in the morning, just like looking at everyone, like everyone else seems to be sleeping except for me. I'm the lonely guy on the planet. Um, and so just kind of being part of a community and even just hearing, hearing her story of how she struggled with sleep. Um, that was something that was very, you know, uh, obviously resonating and comforting to know that there is a way out. And then um, that, you know, that initial path, you know, kind of helped me. I had a, you know, fast forward 10 years, I had a rebound of insomnia was actually a lot worse than the first bound looking back. Um, and I know, you know, you speak a lot in your books, like sometimes you can know too much, you know, sometimes you can like be so, you know, hyper vigilant And so like, oh, I know all the methodologies and I know every trick and technique to be able to outsmart and unravel and get out of it um, that you don't realize that surreptitiously you're actually digging your own hole. Um, and so that's yeah, really, I mean, go ahead. Sorry, it was, this is fantastic. You share so much valuable information, but I just, uh, a little bit more detail before we kind of go to sure. the first at the end there. Sure. Um, Timeline wise, like roughly, like how many years ago was that initial uh, stretch? I'd say that it was uh, 12 years ago now. S something like 12 years ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, tell us about like the one of the earliest things that happened was you were prescribed Ambien. Was like, was it helpful at all or you just didn't, it wasn't helpful? What happened? What was that like? Yeah. You know, so the Ambien itself would give me a few hours of sleep as it does, you know, for, for most clients, it's, you know, it, it, like you 
you know, right many and many times, it's like you're sleeping with your with your foot on the on the accelerator. You know, you're putting the gas and the accelerator at the same time. So you're in a state of hypervigilance. The ambient, you know, is uh, obviously it's a sedative. It's, you know, kind of lulling you into a few hours of sleep. And then you wake up and you're like, well, well, now what? You know, now I'm just, you know, on four hours of sleep and, you know, you become more dependent on the sleeping pill. So, you know, it works temporarily but it's not it's not a great long term solution you know both in terms of its side effects as well as you know the quality of the sleep the longevity longevity of the sleep you know that kind of chemical feeling when you sleep um it's not a it's not a great place to be so i was very much looking to get off of it um but you know sometimes you know the more that you're pushing and to instantly and easily get off of it you're actually you know kind of flaring up your anxiety so it kind of took that finesse of kind of pulling yourself out of it to, to be able to get there and did you like where you, when you first saw like a psychologist were you was that like you were still on Ambien and you started seeing a psychologist the first time yeah yeah and, and that was you know I, I think at least for me that was like a big taboo you know like I'm like I'm not crazy you know why do I need a psychologist you know like have I have I lost my mind you know that now I need to see a therapist and you know remarkably you know and again I think this is something that it's to no fault of anybody's own but you know, oftentimes psychologists, in my opinion, some of them are, are really trained in sleep and some of them overanalyze the issue. Oh, you have a sleep issue. There must be some deep inner tension, you know, that you're struggling with and we're going to have to do years of psychotherapy, you know, to unravel this. And I'm not saying psychotherapy never helps. You know, obviously it, it's, it's, it can be a helpful tool for some people. But I think when the primary issue is sleep, you know, sometimes over analyzing and over complicating the situation can actually make the situation worse. So, you know, I, I appreciated the therapist that I was working with and I learned a lot about, you know, the inner parts of my mind. I think it's, um, I learned a lot more about my own mind and about the human mind through my own struggles than I did in all my years of, you know, psychobiology and UCLA and, and whatnot. So to me, it was very eye-opening learning the inner mechanics of your mind and learning how those things work and definitely was a, a big part of giving me the tools that I, I hopefully, hopefully helped to use today. Ah, uh, makes so much sense. But again, so it, it sounds like that therapist idea was somehow like, okay, we're going to look in your past and find something that explains this, something like that. Right. Right. All right. Very well. And now, um, so uh, you eventually like you, you, you know, that wasn't so helpful, but you stumbled across Sasha Stevens book, right? That's right. That's the next uh, step here. And um, did you, was it kind of like you, you read it and already that alone was really helpful or was there more things going on? What, what happened next there? Yeah. You know, I, I think like at a certain, you know, like just like a virus has to kind of run its course. I find for a lot of people, insomnia sometimes has to run its course, meaning, you know, you kind of have to try everything else for your mind to really kind of fall into that place. You realize like, oh, there's actually nothing else to do about this besides do without which is counterintuitive to my mind. Um, where you kind of, I just remember like uh, taking the day off of school that day and just like sitting on my couch. I'm like, Daron, you're a smart guy. There's got to be a better way than this, you know. Like there, you can't be hooked on Ambien for the rest of your life. There's got to be a better solution. And I think when you kind of get to that kind of end of the road, like th there's got to be a better plan than this. At that point, that kind of opens the mind up to thinking differently about sleep and and looking for solutions that are that are outside the box. Um, you know, so I remember that was very much my experience. And when I read her book, um, it wasn't. You know, I'm like, you're you're right. You know, I just have to. I got to throw away the Ambien. I got to just, you know, train myself. And it's not an easy thing to do to like lift yourself after your booze. I didn't have a sleep coach. I didn't have a support network. I didn't know anybody that had done what I was doing or, or going through that. Um, so it wasn't like an easy thing to do by myself, but I realized, I realized I was creating the issue. I realized the issue was entirely in my mind. Um, and if I was going to get out of it, I just had to kind of take that, that leap, which was a very scary place to be and ditch all my doctors and my psychologists. I'm like, I'm just doing it by myself. I'm literally throwing out the Ambien. Um, and I'm going to train myself to, you know, to, to sleep properly. And so, you know, the first few nights are rough. Um, there's a lot of, you know, peer, fear of panic, anxiety. What happens if this doesn't work? What happens if it goes on forever? You know, what happens if I don't sleep for a year, week or a month or for the rest of my life? Um, but as soon as your mind, you know, kind of uh, catches itself um, and it kind of starts believing in itself and believing it's from, you know, its inner tension. So then, you know, the, the anxiety can, you know, will die down. And, and within a few days, I was, I was getting back to normal. Wow. So it was kind of an intense few days, but then actually it was a big relief and things started yeah. to get better. That's correct. 
Yeah. You know, and, and it's funny, like it's to describe to someone the joy of sleeping. You know, if, if you take someone who like doesn't have insomnia, you're like, oh, my gosh, I slept last night. They're like, well, well I sleep every night. Like, why, why is that a, a novel idea? Um, but when you take someone that struggled with sleep and then you like you go to sleep and you fall asleep and you wake up, it's just it's the most exhilarating thing that you can do. Uh, and so, you know, and that the, the more positivity you have, obviously that feeds into your inner confidence. It feeds into your, you know, your inner belief that you can sleep. And so, you know, it generally gets a person. And, and like you said, that doesn't mean you're going to be have the perfect eight hours of sleep for the rest of your life. Um, but it's not going to be this, you know, this anxiety that's, that's driving things, you know, a perpetual way like it does. Wow. Now, uh, just to give us a picture, like from the from that initial like stressful night, where kind of where it started, and now till this kind of the relief after reading the book, like how long of a stretch was that? It's about six weeks. About six. Oh, so it's it was not actually that long, but it was intense, but it was six weeks stretch. Okay, that's correct. And during those six weeks, like you were, uh, you were studying. Is that correct? You, you had yeah. daytime obligations, <laughs> or like yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm actually a rabbi by training, and I was in rabbinical school at the time. Um, so I ended up, you know, obviously like trying to push through. You don't want it to derail your life in such a in such a huge way. Um, but uh, you know, it was something that I I was trying to balance, as I'm sure you know, insomnia doesn't doesn't give you a uh, a free uh, free pass from life. You know, you still still got life to live. Um, but it was something that I was trying to trying to hold together the best I could. All right. So you and, and you were able to like somehow, you know, get through the studies you needed to do at the time, right? That's correct. Yeah, and yeah. You 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 push through as, as we all did, and we kind of look back at it in those in those crazy days. But um, yeah, you know, as, as you said, sometimes we uh, we can convince that we 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 train ourselves to to push through, and and we don't need as much sleep necessarily as as we always thought we did. Wow. Okay. So now we have you know we have a good picture of that like the, that intense six weeks and and kind of it resolved. And then, you know, I know you actually told me this before, but I, I, I don't remember exactly. But at some point, you actually decided, you know, I think I want to help other people with sleep coaching. Is that, is that kind of what comes next in the story? Yeah. I mean, a after I helped myself, so it was something that I felt very empowered about. You know, I felt very passionate about, like, wow, like that was transformational you know if there's other people going through that i definitely want to help them um i was still committed to becoming a rabbi so that was you know kind of my career path and i dabbled in a little bit of you know sleep coaching here or there i was very interested um, i still am you know and continue to be interested in psychology and the human mind and the interplay between you know the psychology and spirituality and whatnot um so i ended up writing a book on jewish mindfulness uh, a number of years ago in jewish medical ethics those are kind of topics that uh, that interest me um but it wasn't really until kind of two and a half years ago that I um, ended up, you know, deciding to leave the world of full-time rabbinics um, and decided to launch my own sleep coaching business as well. And um, now that takes us to this kind of like, you know, what we call like a speed bump. It was a really big speed bump. Like, yeah. tell us about how that happened and how it resolved as well, of course. Yeah. You know, so I was, I was kind of empowered, like, okay, I have you know, the effortless sleep method under my belt. Um, this method can help all people with sleep issues. And therefore, you know, this is going to be my, my modality in practicing. Um, and it worked until it didn't work. Uh, you know, and I remember one of my clients, um, you know, she was, uh, she was pregnant and she had, um, you know, kind of a similar, you know, just an exacerbation of, of sleep anxiety. And I was like, okay, I know what to do with this effortless sleep method. Um, and it wasn't working for her, you know, and her situation was getting worse and worse and, and she was getting frustrated. And I, as a coach was feeling like, oh, wow, like I feel really bad that I can't help this lady. And um, I remember, you know, one night, again, like a stressful time in my life, whatever was happening. And I remember having this thought that was like their own. Um, if you can't help her, maybe you really couldn't help yourself. Like what happens if you turned into your client? And I know that seems weird, but like that, it was like this very like dormant phobia that just like skyrocketed. Um, then I, as a sleep coach, had my own insomnia, which is really not a fun place to be. <laughs> uh, you, you, you can imagine because you're supposed to be the sleep coach. I, I know you, uh, you've done a video, uh, Dr. Daniel, on, on Matthew Walker speaking about his own insomnia. Um, and, and to me, that's like a really fascinating place to be. And I kind of take comfort of like, oh, well, if, if Matthew Walker could do it, I could do it too. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's like this place where like, you're supposed to be the sleep guru and know how to, you know, help people. And there you are struggling with your own sleep, which is like a really ironic and, and challenging, you know, inner place to be. So that's really when, you know, when I'm like, okay, you know, Daron, you can do this. And I was like, okay, effortless sleep method, not working, CBTI, not working. I was like, oh, what, 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 what do I do now? You know? So then, 
Um, and, and I really believe, like looking back, insomnia has always been my greatest teacher. It's always kind of forced me to look at things from a different angle and analyze things and really gain a deeper insight into my human mind. And anytime that my insomnia comes back up, I'm like, okay, well, I realize I don't, I don't have this down 100%. I need to grow more. I need to gain more insight. And so I kind of like, okay, what else does it want to teach me about the human mind that I can then use to help my clients? So at that point, I started doing a lot more research, you know, because as, as Dr. Daniel uh, will tell you, CBTI is, is the gold standard out there, you know, in the world of medicine and psychology. Um, but from the insider view, it's actually like, you know, trying to do brain surgery with a butter knife. Like it's, yeah, it, it might work and it works for some people, but it's kind of a crude and blunt way of, you know, training the mind out of anxiety without really getting to the root of the issue and sometimes making it worse, you know, with all of the, the rules and the rigidity, um, and kind of, you know, the, 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 distracted focus like the idea of you know the bed creates hyper arousal well as you know as you say it's not the bed that creates hyper arousal it's my, it's my brain that's creating hyper arousal and i you know it's nothing to do with staying in bed or not staying in bed um and so i was there you know kind of like trying to dig myself out of my second wave of insomnia and that's when i started doing more research about acceptance and commitment therapy um i ended up at that point in my life um, looking into hypnosis, which I really um, I feel is a very interesting and powerful tool that I, I use a lot in my practice, as well as um, Dr. Daniel's principle of NATO, uh, which I think, you know, as, as he says, kind of is something that you can incorporate a lot into your, you know, into a lot of other systems. Um, and so I've definitely, you know, through that process, cured my own insomnia, but um, through that, you kind of also formulated my own worldview um, a lot more in line with, you know, kind of a combination of hypnosis, NATO and acceptance and commitment therapy and very much kind of away from the, you know, traditional CBTI um, practices. And so I, I, that's definitely the model that I've adopted for myself. Um, it's, a, it's a model that I've really, um, you know, found be a lot more successful for my clients. Um, it's something that I, you know, every day continue to, to learn, you know, trying to perfect, trying to, you know, understand the language of the mind um, and really, you know, how to speak to it in the, in the best way possible. But um, it's something that I really feel blessed to, you know, to have learned to be part of it and to continue to, to practice with my clients. Wow. Wonderful. And now um, I want to ask you this, this kind of second, you know, phase that was actually even more intense now because like, I, mm -hmm. the added pressure of being a sleep coach, of course, and all this, like, was that also, uh, you know, intense as it was, was it also a, a briefer episode or how long, how long did, was that one? You know, you, you, we, you don't exactly take notes when, when all this yeah, is going yeah. on. You're just like, you're trying to keep the ship afloat. Um, it was more intense, you know, because in the first case, it was like, oh, I know nothing. Oh, I read a book that has the answer. That's amazing. You know, like that that's phenomenal. There's somebody else went through it and she got out of it. I practiced it. It worked. Phenomenal. In the second case, it was so much harder because I was supposed to be the guy that knew everything. So like, how can I not have the answers? How can this not work? For me? Maybe I really do have that, that case of insomnia that can't be cured. Like what happens? If, so not only is that not, I'm not going to sleep for the rest of my life. Now I'm, I can't even be a sleep coach. You know, now my whole business is down the drain. So like it, it just created this, like it almost like 10 X the pressure, you know, yeah. that's on you, um, which, which creates like a very, you know, kind of different dynamic. And, and I, again, hard to say the exact dates in my mind. Um, there was an acute period that I was back on Ambien at that time. Um, and it was, I would say longer lingering and I was, you know, like going up and down and up and down and really, you know, like learning a lot of these different modalities and putting it together while at the same time having to put it together for my clients as well. And like, you know, using myself as kind of my own guinea pig to, <laughs> to kind of see what worked and, and, and what didn't work and, you know, how best to do it. But, you know, as, as I tell, as I tell everyone, it, you really come out so much stronger because of it. You become so much wiser um, you know, the, the ability to help people not only with sleep issues, but with obsessive thoughts, with anxiety, it's literally an epidemic going on in our, in our generation. And, you know, anybody who has a real deep insight into that and can really help people do that, you're worth your weight in gold. So, you know, I kind of like, it's obviously never fun to go through these things in the moment, but I look back at that time period of my life and I'm like, thank God that happened too, because if it wouldn't, I don't know if I would have really dug in. I would have just, you know, been practicing other people's approaches and, you know, been somewhat superficial, but, you know, really diving in and really, you know, believing in something, feeling it, you know, through your own body is, it's a very liberating experience. And I'm really glad that I went through it. Wow. Yeah. I, I know you, um, 
didn't actually answer the question. It doesn't really matter. Re- repeat, the, repeat the question. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just uh, uh, joking with you, Doran. But uh, no, no. The, the second, and it's, it, you, it, the second like phase, how long it was. And I know it's not important. It's just like to give people a kind of a context or idea. Yeah, I, I would say that it was probably closer to a year, oh, up and down. Like it wasn't, it wasn't mm-hmm. acutely a year, but it had like a lot of. Yeah ups and downs um until you know it's, it's also confusing like imagine you know just put yourself in my shoes for a second there you are a sleep coach and you kind of have to figure all of this out on your own you know w- when you're a lay person and you read sasha steven's book you're like oh okay there's a sleep expert they have the answer great but you know from a from a coach's perspective well you know i have the hip, the hip, I, you know, I, I am a hypnotherapist now. I have the hypnosis lady telling me one thing. I have, you know, the CBT people telling me another thing. I have, you know, Dr. Guy Meadows and the ACT telling me a third thing. I have Dr. Daniel telling me a fourth thing. And like, and they're all contradict each other. I'm like, you know, this is really confusing, you know, like, I, and I have to try to figure all of this out on my own. Um, it, it, it definitely, you know, can be like a very hard place in that regard to really, you know, kind of be able to scratch the surface and really dive in and understand where is the truth in each modality, how to use that kernel of truth in, in a comprehensive whole, and how to also, and I think this is really the skill of a good sleep coach, to know when to apply what to who, and not to kind of, you know, blanket like, oh, you know, everybody, you know, does wet best with this approach, but there's a subtlety here, and to be able to kind of pick up on the on, on, on people's minds and where people's minds are getting stuck and how to get them unstuck um that's something that takes time it takes sensitivity it takes finesse um and so yeah it, it took me longer to you know get hold of this and like i said to me it's a it's an ongoing process it's not a oh now i've mastered it 100 percent and i have nothing else to learn every client that comes to me with a struggle is something that okay i realize I have to have a better way to explain it. I even, you know, called up Dr. Daniel uh, a couple of weeks ago to like ask him a question, like, and just in terms of people's minds get stuck on a point, how do I help them, you know, the exact language to, to help them get through that. And I think it's an endless process. And I think, you know, just as uh, if Lexus can be the ang- endless pursuit of perfection to anyone working with people, working in mental health, working with sleep, you realize it's not like, uh, and you know, not like I, I, now I figured it out, but it's like, okay, you know, I realize people have their own idiosyncrasies, people have their own language and their own strengths and weaknesses. And I'm constantly evolving, constantly developing, constantly adapting my skills to be able to help even the most challenging cases based upon wherever they're at. Um, and I think that's, you know, that, that was an important mentality to develop. And I think that, you know, for anybody in the mental health field and anybody in sleep coaching to be able to assume the position of a student and not of a, of a master, um, that I'm a student for life. Um, you know, just to, to quote a, a teaching from the Ethics of Our Fathers in, in Jewish text, um, it says, chacham, who, adab, who is someone who's wise, who learns from everybody. Um, and I think, you know, adopting that mentality certainly got me to where I am, you know, achieved my success. And, you know, certainly I've learned a lot from Dr. Daniel and I've learned a lot from everybody, whether I believe they're right or wrong. But to be able to kind of just be open minded, I think, has been my greatest, my greatest asset. And to be able not to be afraid of to say, you know, I'm wrong. Maybe I don't know everything. Maybe there's still more to learn. And to be able to adopt that mindset, I think, is something that's, that's very important to keep in mind. 100 percent agree with you. And, you know, one thing that one thing that came to mind as we were speaking here um, was, you know, I think a. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, aspects of CBTI. But that's kind of where I came from. I learned like that this whole like, you know, sleep restriction, the idea of like spending less time in bed. Like there, there are fun, fundamentals there that were really helpful to me. But I think sort of one of my critiques of like the traditional system is that you have a, a CBTI practitioner and they have a client who doesn't do well. Well, then it becomes sort of like, well, you're doing something wrong and, and you know, there's nothing wrong with the, our ways. You know, and it could have been like, you know, it, in a way, if you hadn't had this like speed bump, you could have been like, oh, well, something is wrong with you doing. I'm going to continue this effortless sleep method thing. And you wouldn't have evolved and like been able to uh, help so many other people. So, yeah, I totally see that. And uh, I think, it, you know, there's a couple other topics that we can go into now that I thought were really interesting, including like your kind of philosophy and also including like, this like we, we both see this kind of revolution happening in, in our space, which is really fun to talk to. But before we that we go there, I want you know people in the community to know that um, you know you're a sleep coach and you have kind of found your niche. You're pr- predominantly helping people that are also Jewish, correct? 
That's correct. Yeah, no, it's, um, I, I know we had spoken, you know, in terms of like business models in the past. So that was also kind of part of, you know, my, my evolution and development. Um, I was working for seven years in full-time Jewish nonprofit. And then when I kind of left that world and I decided to branch out to the, you know, to, to start my own private sleep coaching practice. So my idea was, you know, just, you know, go, go where the money is. You know, my, my company is officially called Executive Sleep Consulting. And I'm like, well, who has money? Executives have money. I want to be the executive sleep coach. Um, and ironically, that actually very much backfired. I was not successful in business based upon that approach. And when I kind of shifted that model and started working with people within my ethnic group, within my community, I found myself to be a lot more successful. Um, you know, the the marketing was a lot easier. The selling was a lot easier. The rapport was a lot easier. And I know, you know, we've spoken about in the past, I think it's, it's a great idea for anybody in the sleep coaching space and really in any, you know, person to person helping space to that, you know, it's not that we're discriminatory against anybody. I'm sure me and you and everybody is happy to work with whoever has issues, but to start with our community first, to start with people that you share something in common, you have a common language, you have a common, um, you know, vernacular and set of values. And those are the people, you know, anybody is able to pay for sleep problems for me sleep problems you know if you're struggling with sleep it's there's no higher value and asset in your life um and so you know to stop kind of chasing money and to start thinking you know what what community would i love to help what community do i feel you know my 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 natural tendency is to help with and so when i kind of shifted my you know my language and the you know focus on my marketing to the jewish community um that's just kind of where my business naturally developed and that's where you know most of my clients are and i think it's amazing today with the technology that we have that i can help clients all over the world um you know as, as can any coach and so to not be limited by your geographic location and to say like you know if i could pick a pocket of people in the world you know i, I know dr daniel is great and he's you know running his youtube channel and uh you know reaching out to hundreds of thousands of people across the globe and that's one model and, and obviously he's really successful at that but for other sleep coaches or anybody in, in the coaching space you don't necessarily need to be you know the world spokesman for sleep issues you know to have a successful sleep practice you don't need to be a guru with 100,000 followers on you know on, on any social media channel i think you need to find your niche and speak to their to their um their language and to their values and to their pain points and you know you can have a successful sleep practice and and feel you know fulfilled and, and make an income and i think you know that's, that's an important thing for anybody to keep in mind wonderful yeah i thanks for sharing and i you know anyone in, in our community that you know feels particularly like you know Jordan is my person. I want to know that they can uh, reach you, and I'll put the links in the description <laughs> as well, of course. Um, now, uh, second, the next thing I want to go to was like you, you know, you, you. I know this is like still evolving for all of us. It's still evolving kind of our, our philosophy, right? But sure. Uh, and I know this is not an easy question, but if you would, um, if somebody would ask you, like, okay, so in your kind of worldview at this point, how would you explain insomnia, and how would you say is is, uh, is the best way for us to leave that the struggle? Yeah, you know, I, I've definitely, um, I believe that insomnia is a, it's, it's most probably similar to a phobia. Um, it's a phobia that our mind creates. Um, you know, I happen to differ with Dr. Daniel on, on this point, is that I don't, um, I know Dr. Daniel specializes in anxiety-driven insomnia, and in his vernacular, that's what insomnia is. It's a, that, that self-definition, I, I respect and appreciate that. My definition of insomnia is a little bit broader. Insomnia is a symptom of not being able to sleep. And I believe that insomnia can come from a few ways. I mean, for example, you know, some of my clients just are, are chronically overworked, stressed out people, um, you know, and, and that causes them to not sleep. So it's not necessarily about, quote unquote, the anxiety or the phobia regarding sleep. It's more about teaching them work-life boundaries, stress management. You know, I, I have a, a fellow who's the CEO of a company with 1,500 uh, 1500 employees and he does a lot of business in China. So, you know, his, you know, like nine o'clock at night is prime day in China. And so he gets on his email and starts, you know, sending things and this deal and that thing. And, you know, that was a major factor in his sleep. So, you know, it can come from a lot of ways. I think more often than not, the main, however people get into it, the number one thing I do see is, um, is anxiety driven insomnia. Um, you know, but just to say, like, 
there's there's different different causes and different strokes that that can kind of go into it i also do believe in also a um you know the the subconscious role in insomnia so for instance you know i had a client who um when he was in his 50s he um his body was invaded by a uh, by killer bacteria and he was almost on his deathbed the doctors had given up hope of him um and he actually ended up having a miraculous survival but since then he wasn't sleeping well so you know there was definitely a sleep anxiety point that came in there but there was also this kind of subconscious trauma block of don't let go of control you can die don't become vulnerable you know who knows what would happen if you close your eyes you might not wake up and that wasn't that wasn't a con- conscious you know uh, cognizant decision that was a subconscious decision and there i felt that hypnosis was a really powerful tool and he really felt as well to help unblock that you know that sleep um that sleep anxiety that he had latent within his mind so you know i, I just think in my opinion sleep can be um you know kind of a subtle and um and uh you know multifaceted approach but definitely when it comes to kind of more conventional anxiety driven insomnia i definitely i think that a combination of the nato approach of you know training your mind to not fear this imaginary enemy as well as the approach of you know kind of acceptance and commitment therapy of becoming okay with your thoughts of learning to make space with your thoughts and diffusing your thoughts to me that is the the winning model that really helps people not only get through it temporarily but you know to really to train their mind to to permanently get over it wonderful yeah sounds uh, you know thanks for sharing that again again and uh, you already said it quite well, quite well. You said it very well, I'd say. But uh, just for the commu- for the community, just nobody's confused. I think our ideas are actually very similar. But you have a broader, like you, you're more of a kind of broader sleep coach. And if somebody again has more like you know trouble sleeping because of like external stress in your kind of vernacular, you 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 call that insomnia. Versus uh, for me, it's like anxiety driven, like sleep issues is is insomnia by definition to me. So just clarifying that one more time for the community. And then finally here, I thought we could have a really interesting discussion on kind of like, you know, big picture here. You know, I, I we've just touched on this in, in, in a conversation, but I think you and I both have this idea that there is like at some point there will be kind of some revolutionary change in this space of kind of what we now call mental health. So I'll, I'll let you go first. Like, how do you, do you see this happening? How do you see it happening? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I feel we're in a really exciting time. Um, I think, I think there's an exciting time in a number of senses. I think there's a lot of almost kind of popular uprisings that are happening within the both physical and the mental health space. Um, on the physical health space, I think you really have the debate between the conventional medical world and the functional medicine world. Um, and I think that's a really interesting debate and each side, you know, has, has a kernel of truth, you know, to their side. I grew up in a very traditional medical world, you know, being trained at UCLA and my father was a, um, a internal medicine doctor, you know, and we, just, we grew up in that world. If something's wrong, you go to a doctor and they always have the answer. Um, and, you know, I myself struggled with it, other issues, uh, skin issues that ended up being cured with functional medicine. And that really kind of opened my eyes like, oh, you know, maybe there are different types of doctors with different types of answers and different types of approaches. So that's kind of one, you know, kind of emerging front that's happening on the more physical medical space and, you know, battling for recognition, battling for authority, for, you know, medical dollars and funding. Um, that's kind of one really interesting space that I personally f- find very interesting. And on the mental health side, I think, you know, we kind of we see, you know, kind of the more traditional world of CBT and and, and you know, more uh, psychotherapy and whatnot. And, you know, kind of an emerging field of, you know, both in terms of ACT and acceptance and commitment, um, but also in terms of NATO, in terms of, you know, also believing that sometimes the solution is not so complicated. Maybe people, you know, I think a lot of the, of the question that a lot of the emerging people are asking is, you know, maybe people don't need years of psycho- psychotherapy to get over things. Um, I'm personally interested in in hypnosis as well and how hypnosis plays into psychotherapy. So, you know, for example, I'm working with a client now who literally this guy had seen 50 therapists and he had never seen solutions. He had given up on ever seeing a solution. And within a few sessions of hypnosis, he's felt so much more empowered and so much more transformed. Uh, So that ability to, you know, speak right to the root of the mind that sometimes, you know, traditional psychotherapy overlooks. Um, hypnotherapy, I believe, is an emerging field that really has a lot of answers to um, people's issues. I'm, I'm working with another client who's actually a therapist herself, which is a fun thing to do. Um, and she's also found a real huge benefit um, from working with what I believe is in another emerging field, which is actually sp- 
spiritual hypnotherapy. Um, she's a very spiritually oriented person. And so to not, you know, like uh, I know we separate church and state in our government, but you know, to not, you know, as I guess as a former rabbi or current rabbi, however you look at me, um, to be able to be able to combine, like to stop speaking to people on a superficial level, and, like start speaking to them at the root of their mind and their soul. Um, that's something that really interests me as well. Uh, and so, you know, in addition to that, I know this is a short question with a long answer. I think that in terms of the, the health coaching and mental health coaching space, that's kind of, um, it's a little bit challenging, you know, the traditional world, you know, in the traditional world, you know, you need a bachelor's and a master's and a doctorate and, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of hours of clinical training and, you know, accreditation. And, you know, these kind of young upstart health coaches are like, um, maybe you don't maybe we can actually help people a lot quicker and a lot more efficiently um we just need to you know like i imagine if you imagine kind of the traditional both physical and mental health space like they're there's they're driving this like aircraft carrier you know it's a huge boat and it's got all this money invested in it and you know like to turn the thing it takes like seven years just like turn the rudder a little bit to start shifting um and you know these uh, young upstart coaches are coming in with the little speed boats and like no we can actually go a lot faster for a lot cheaper and we can actually be you know a lot more innovative innovative of this and do things a lot quicker and you know you kind of like see these two you know kind of systems um and i believe that there's going to be an integration of these systems i believe each one is going to you know kind of challenge the other um but i believe there's a lot of exciting uh, exciting things on the horizon of the health space and i really encourage both you know clients and patients to you know be a little more open-minded you know understanding that there's not just one right answer different people think in different ways. And if you haven't found your solution in a more traditional path, um, don't give up hope and, you know, really push, push for yourself, advocate for yourself, learn about the different options out there and find an approach that really does work for you. Yeah, no, well said. And, you know, you included a lot, a lot of uh, very interesting points in this, in this reply. And uh, I would just say we should, we should, you know, do like a follow-up in like 10 years and see like where things are going and what's happened. But yeah, I think also we're we're very very early on, but basically, kind of, if I try to, I have so many things I could discuss here, but like try to give like a big picture kind of idea of things is is basically that I think of it this way that I happen to be reading like randomly like this uh, this biography on uh, John D. Rec Rockefeller, and you know uh, people have different opinions from him, but anyway, not getting into that, but. He, you know, he, he had a lot of money and he was interested in philanthropy in a time where sort of the medical world was like in, in like, it was a magical place for, for, for that, you know, mm. like just discovering like bacteria and, and vaccines and serums and, and like, it, it was incredible, like, uh, you know, the, 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 like what medicine could do at that time. So I think, you know, as a kind of a, you know, humanity, we started really looking at, okay, the solution to all problems are this, like we, we take it to the lab, we study it, we find a medication or a vaccine, and then we fix it. And I think we, we know, you know, we, we, we took that approach to what we call mental health too. We, we decided like, okay, we're going to find the kind of the, the neurotransmitter that's a problem. We're going to find the, the, the thing that can fix it. And that's created a system that's, you know, more, it kind of actually becomes more and more unhelpful, I think, because we're, we're going from a world where like syphilis and tuberculosis and, you know, those things were like, you know, the big problems to, to a world where, you know, our physical health, like, yes, we, we have cancer, we have cardiovascular disease, no, no question about that. But more and more, you know, we're going to a world where kind of what we call mental health becomes like a greater and greater proportion of, of all our struggles, including like, you know, if you look at cardiovascular health is a lot of the driven by obesity, right? Which is driven by another internal struggle, which is like a trying to get rid of emotions by eating th things of that nature. Right. right but right. The, the medical system, even the psychological, I think it's just not, it's not built for it. So you have this huge conflict where people go to see the doctor or psychologist and they actually are not getting any real meaningful help a lot of times because it's right. just, a, it's just a huge mismatch. Right. So I think inevitably something will have to give, something will have to change. And that's where I see this kind of, mentorship uh, you know peer-to-peer -peer coaching you know like the space we're in I, I just see an immense potential for it and i i think uh, we're just in the very 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 early beginning of it and like to your point there about who who do i want to work with who do i want to see like you know do do you know so a lot of people i think is going to be like do i want to you know work with somebody who has all these degrees but maybe doesn't understand me at all or do i want to work with somebody who is gone through this themselves and have like this insider view of things i think a lot of times people will choose the latter and uh i think it's uh, inevitable but i also think there will be like yeah 
some type of merging or integration may also be happening. But anyway, what, what do you think when I say this? Right. Yeah, no, it's, um, I, I believe that it's a real tragedy. I'm not anti-psychiatric medication. You know, if someone needs psychiatric medication because they have a genuine um, mental imbalance, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar, um, you know, these medications can be life-saving. You know, I'm certainly not, would, wouldn't encourage anybody otherwise. But I believe that so much of the kind of the binary view, you know, and it's, it's to no fault of the doctors. We've set up a system that's designed this way. You go to a doctor, you know, insurance has to cover this. You got to put people in a box. They need codes. You know, the, you have major depression or you don't, you have anxiety, you don't, you have insomnia or you don't, you know, it's a, and, and, you know, what are we going to do for you? There's a protocol, there's a DSM, you know, there's psychiatric manuals of how to treat these things. Um, and through that kind of monolithic thinking, we've really created a problem that's spiraling out of control. Um, you know, I know in, in my own community, I imagine every community across America and across the world, mental health is a rampant issue and it's not being addressed appropriately. Um, you know, you go to your doctor and you say, doctor, I'm feeling nervous. So, you know, the doctor says, oh, you, you have anxiety. Well, let me give you anti-anxiety medication. Um, and that's what the doctor is paid and, and designed to do. He's not, he doesn't have the time or the wherewithal or the training to say, you know, let's really get, get to the root of this anxiety and let's help you get through this. You know, and he, here's my cell phone and, you know, we're, we're going to meet every week and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here going to be your support network. He might refer to a psychologist. Um, but, and even then, you know, they might go to a psychiatrist, which, you know, has their own, like, you know, let's start with medication and then, you know, let's do psychotherapy. You know, again, there's, there's a lot of different perspectives, but I believe most people are just like, oh, well, I have anxiety. I must have a biochemical deficiency. I must have a neurotransmitter deficiency. I don't have enough serotonin. Let me get, get let me get on an SSRI. Um, but it's really, it's really the last resort, not the first one. I, you know, an hour ago, I got off the phone with a client who, you know, who went in for sleep issues. The doctor put her on Xanax. Um, she was having side effects of the Xanax. The doctor says, no problem. We'll wean you off the Xanax by putting you on Ambien. She says, okay. So now she's hooked on Ambien, you know, and, and she, uh, you know, called me to get off of it. Um, that's something that I hear every day in my practice. And again, I'm not criticizing doctors for doing that, but it really is you know, from the more generalized sleep issues, I think 99% of people, or if not more, do not need to be on sleeping pills. Um, they need to be taught the inner dimensions of their mind. You know, no one's ever done a blood test and say, oh, yeah, you're, you're deficient in Ambien. You know, you really need an Ambien supplement, you know, to, to get you through this. That's not, that's not where it's at. Um, the pills are cheap, the pills are quick, um, but it's really just putting a bandaid on the issue. And I think, you know, the same way that people are running to Ambien, you know, you know, uh, millions of scripts a month, um, you know, they're running to Prozac, they're running to Xanax, they're running to, you know, the antidepressants, they're running to the Seroquel. And I think we really, as a society, need to say, like, like, pause, you know, is this the best way of doing things? And how can we make um, efficient mental health options available for people that is going to help them get to the root of their issue quickly, be effective, be cost effective, um, be innovative, be customized, and not, you know, not sending people down a rabbit hole of medication, which, you know, oftentimes does not make things better in the long term. So, yeah, I, I really am a big believer that we are ripe for a revolution in the world of mental health. Um, and, you know, hopefully, especially with the advent of social media, of the resources out there, people like Dr. Daniel, you know, get it, getting on the soapbox and, you know, screaming from, from YouTube about, um, you know, a, a different way of doing things. Um, I really think, you know, coupled with people having, you know, being able to access, you know, coaches and, and therapists from all over the world now and people working re more remotely, uh, I think we really are, you know, getting getting geared up for a real shift and a transition. And I think we're going to look back in 20 or 30 years and say like, wow, I can't believe, you know, America wrote that many scripts for Prozac every year when there was such a better way of doing things. Um, you know, and I think I, I, I'm looking forward to the day that medication is reserved for people who genuinely, um, genuinely need it, genuinely have that chemical imbalance, and we're able to be a lot better at, at the therapy to be able to help people get off the medication and, and heal from the inside out. Wow. Yeah, you, you said something there, towards and that was exactly what, what I was going to add here, which is, you know, basically, I think things like insomnia and anxiety and, you know, all these kind of inner struggles, they basically come from, like, the way we think, like we have, there's some thoughts that are producing this or, or something of that nature, right? 
And if we look at it this way, it's quite clear to see that not, not no pill can really change how we think. It's just impossible. So I also see something of the future where we look back upon this era and say, like, what were we doing? How could we think that some chemical could change how we thought? Like, and, and, and hopefully we'll be looking back and being kind of flabbergasted because we're in a much, much more peaceful and better place. And the other point I just want to make is, again, like, yeah, there's there's really no blame to be like, you know, do doled out anywhere. Like it's nobody's fault. Like the doctors are not equipped and trained for it. Like, and I think on the psychology front too, it's just like the, the basic fundamental teaching that people get is just not, not the, the, the easiest one. So everybody's actually in a really, really tough spot. Like from my perspective, I have so many friends uh, that are you know still practicing doctors and they are very, very frustrated because they, they know, they know that like 70, 80% of, uh, you know, patients they have actually struggle, you know, have some type of internal struggle, but what are they going to do? You know, like all they know is like, I can prescribe this medication and often that's what's expected of them. So it's like this really sad situation where the, the patient feels frustrated and not heard and they feel like, oh, all I'm getting is medication. And the doctor feels like, I don't know what to do. I'm frustrated. I don't, and all I can do is prescribe medication. So yeah, I think all of this puts us in a place where big changes is in, is inevitable so uh, yeah and, and, and i think also just to add on to that i think we still live in a world and i think these walls are breaking down but the stigma and the taboo regarding mental health um you know I, I think that people should really you know own up to their mental health issues you know and not not be afraid of dealing with them not being afraid of being open with them discussing things with them there are so many amazing resources and, and coaches and, and options out there um, and that, you know, we shouldn't be more ashamed of mental health than, um, than, than physical health of, you know, you would never, you know, think, well, I broke my bones and I, I don't want to go to the ER. What happens if someone finds out, you know, like, of course you would run to your orthopedist and, and get it fixed, you know, um, and that's something that I'm very, um, I'm very open with my clients on. And I think that's something that also I want to see as a shift in mental health, as opposed to this top-down approach, you go to the psychiatrist and, oh, I'm the professional, I have all the answers. Like I tell my clients from the beginning, you know, I struggled with anxiety, I struggled with raising thoughts, I struggled with insomnia, I know what you're going through. Um, you know, this is something that's normal, um, it's real. When you understand the inner mechanisms of your brain, of why your brain does this, it becomes like less shameful, you're like, oh, my brain was really there to protect me. My brain was really, you know, trying its best. I'm really brilliant, analytical, and and wise. And my mind just didn't understand kind of fully how to process that. It kind of takes the shame out of this situation. Um, and I think the more that you know, therapists and coaches are able to be open with their own struggles and open with, um, you know, kind of bringing down the that stigma and, and the taboo regarding mental health. Hopefully, that will enable more people to open themselves up, you know, to treatment and, and care to help them improve their lives as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. It's uh, you know when you do this work, you see, you know, you you can't help but look within, right? You know, you 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 know, you share thoughts with people. You you give people what you think is sound ideas, but but then you you can't you know, like we tell somebody kind of like you know don't focus on numbers and you know like you can't help but like but I do that I do that myself you know and, and the type of the, like, that's the thing. we're all the same we're just all humans you know right. so um, yeah any. Uh, I will, again, I will share the link to so anybody wants to connect with, with you, Ron, uh, they can do that, but um, I'll put that in the description. And uh, it's been it's been wonderful getting to talk to you. Uh, thanks for coming on. Coach Daniel, it's been my, absolutely my pleasure. Um, I appreciate having you as a, as a friend, a mentor, um, and someone who's really, really leading in the space in a very genuine and authentic way. Um, and I wish you much success in, in all of your endeavors, and uh, you should continue to help hundreds of thousands of people. Love it. Thanks so much. Bye my now. My pleasure. All the rest.